Well, good morning and welcome to Willingdon. We are so glad that you are here. You made it on Daylight Savings. Congratulations. Congratulate yourself. That's good. We are excited to gather together and um, God is always on time. Amen. And um, so we're here to worship him. I'm going to read from Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. And it says, let us praise God for his glorious grace. Say glorious grace. For it is the free gift that he gave us through his dear son, Jesus. For it is by the blood of his son that we are set free. Can we stand and give thanks today to our God for his amazing grace? Let's worship him. darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the king above
to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from the throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt praise the father praise the son praise the spirit three in one god of glory majesty praise forever to the king of kings to trust in you we know that you are faithful and so when we sense the temptation to be fearful or anxious remind us to be still and know that you are God that in you we can rest and find hope remind us of this remind us of your promises as we worship you in this time Be 
still my soul The Lord is on thy side Bear patiently The cross of grief or pain Live to thy God To order and provide In every change He faithful Thy best, thy heavenly friend Through thorny ways Lead to a joyful land Be still, my soul Thy God doth undertake To guide the future As he has the past
chariots or the mechanisms of their world, their finances, their educations, their relationships, and all those things are good, Lord. Uh, We want to trust in the name of the Lord our God and all those other things will be added as needed. But Father, we pray that you would put our soul at rest, Lord. Uh, Thank you, God, that it is. Eternity is already set in our soul, God. That's what you say. But Father, we pray that it will be at peace here on earth, Lord, as it one day will be in heaven, God. We pray, Lord, that as we put our mind and focus on you, God, you will keep us, Lord, in perfect peace. It cannot be attained any other way, Lord, except through complete trust and obedience to you. So, Father, there is no work in that. There is rest in that. Help us not to just strive and work after it, Lord, but to find ourselves lying down in green pastures, Lord, restored by your presence. We love you, Father, and we find hope and peace and joy and strength all that we need for every moment of every day we find in you we love you thank you for all of this it is amazing in jesus name we pray and everyone said amen 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 Amen. why don't you turn and greet one another as you're seated and then we're going to celebrate some baptisms today yeah When I look out over this vast ocean, I'm urged to dive down to its unplumbed depths, be immersed in its underwater wonder, explore the beauty of the ocean floor and be carried by the power of its currents. It is grander, more unfathomable, wider and deeper than anything I can imagine. When baptized, I am immersed in someone greater, more majestic and more beautiful than anyone I could ever comprehend. I'm invited into the sacred fellowship of the Father, the Son and the Spirit. That's why Jesus says I'm baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. When I'm baptized, I'm saying yes to life with God and no to my sin-bound, independent ways. I'm saying I've been reborn. I have new life and now, by trusting God, I will follow Jesus. I embark on this journey of following in His footsteps, learning to live as He would have me live, becoming like Him, doing what He would do by the power and joy of the Spirit. When I'm baptized, I'm saying something to the world around me. I'm one with Jesus and with his people. I have a new family. I'm going to follow Jesus in every area of my life. I'm all in. Before I rely on myself more and trust on my own capabilities, I thought that doing good to others is a way to salvation. I also believe that when I go to church every Sunday, it's enough as a Christian. I started attending Willing the Church in 2010 when my cousin and her husband invited me. Soon enough, I regularly go with them to attend Sunday services. But then I also go back to Catholic Church at the same time. Until in 2015, when my husband came to Canada, and we both decided to regularly attend the Sunday service here at Willingdon. Then on December 2021, the biggest trial came to our marriage life and to myself when I was diagnosed with cancer while undergoing fertility treatments. I surrendered my life to Jesus as my personal healer, and I started reading the Bible, attended Set Free, and Discovery classes in Willingdon. My daily struggles are still the same, but I'm not worried because I cling to the promise of God that says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God will transcend. All understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus.
This is a great day. And Bella, do you confess that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior and that you will follow him all the days of your life? Yes. Upon the confession of your faith, I want to baptize you in the name of the Father and in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. I was away from the Lord for many years, and I did not build a relationship with Him at the Catholic Church nor at the spiritual center I visited for more than a decade. I used it to think I was a good daughter to Him just for a volunteer from, from, from time to time. I prayed to ask Him a lot of things, but rarely asked for His forgiveness. Last September, I struggled hard with a breakup relationship and the loss of a friendship that was important to me. It was a moment of deep darkness when I heard this call to go to Willingdon. So I went to the Sunday service, and while there, I felt God's love, care, and kindness, and how I needed to be closer to Him. I became sure I could no longer live without Him in my life, without following His plans and surrendering my life to Him. I learned more in the Discover Family classes on how to build an intimate relationship with God. And there is no other day I don't pray for His forgiveness and His patience for my sins and also for His guidance so I don't deviate from His path and His plans for me. My next step in this journey, though, is to be baptized. Another amazing testimony. And Denise, I want to ask you, do you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And are you willing to live for him for the rest of your life? Yes. Upon the confession of your faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Hello, Willingdon. My name is Song Do Lee. It has been 10 years since I came to Canada from South Korea, and I'm currently working as a shuttle bus driver. Since I was born in the faith, I thought I was just an ordinary Christian. Although I went to church and worshipped every Sunday, my life was secular. My career, money, success, relationships, and persistent anxiety and depression. More than anything, I realized that I didn't have joy and true peace of Heavenly Father's love within me. After thinking about it carefully, I found I'm too afraid of watching my sin naked like Adam. By being baptized today and becoming a member of willing the church, I confess that I'm a sinner and want to be cleansed, and I want to enjoy it through joy, comfort, and peace that the world cannot give. Please pray for me. Thank you. I'll ask two questions in English and Korean. Uh, Songdo, do you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and will you live your life in obedience to Him? 하나님의 사랑하는 아들 이성도 형제님 형제님 예수 그리스도를 형제님의 주인으로 구원자로 고백하고 그분을 위해 형제님의 삶을 순종하며 살겠습니까? Yes. On the basis of your confession of faith, I'll baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son Jesus Christ, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. 형제님의 믿음의 고백을 따라 성부, 성자, 성령님의 이름으로 세례를 드립니다.
Praise God for those who came to be baptized this morning. Let's all pray together. We thank you, Lord, for the wonderful gift of baptism, a tangible step to demonstrate to the world that you have touched our lives, you have shown us your forgiveness, and we want to follow you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for these three individuals who have come today who want to give your, their lives to you. We know that this is not a destination, but just a beginning of a new relationship with you, God. So I pray that your spirit walks with them and helps them to get, uh, to get closer to you, Lord. Help them to grow to know you more, to love you more day by day, and to love the body of Christ as well. I pray that the rest of the church can come alongside them and to encourage, to spiritually nourish, to help these people grow in you. And I pray also that your spirit moves in the hearts of others in our church who may have believed in their hearts that you are their Lord and Savior and who believe that you have forgiven them, but they haven't taken the step of baptism yet. I pray that you stir in their hearts, move in their hearts to feel the desire to be baptized. And I pray that these testimonies that we share can help others to know why you are so valuable and treasured. And I pray that you can continue to bring more and more people into your kingdom, so that our baptistry is continually filled with people being baptized, God. I pray that that becomes a routine in our church as many more people come to know you and dedicate their lives to you. We thank you, God, for this beautiful time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jonathan. I'm the pastor of Life Groups here at Willingham Church. This is my third time hosting today, so I hope I mess up a little bit less. But I want to welcome everybody here. We're so glad to have you, whether you've been here for a long time or you're new. We're glad to welcome you today. If you are new, we want to encourage you guys to get connected with our church. And there's a few ways to do that. First off, in front of your seats, there is a, a connect card. You can fill this out with your information and give it to the resource center. And we'll have somebody to contact you to get in touch. Or you can also visit the Here to Help our resource center, our welcome center, or a connect table in the cafeteria as well. We don't want you to leave feeling like you never, didn't get to meet anybody. We want to make sure that you know that you are very much welcomed here. And also, if you'd like to have us to pray for you, if you need any prayer assistance, we also have prayer cards as well. Please fill it out and submit it to the resource center, and we'll have a group of people praying for you and your needs, whatever it may be. And if you'd like to worship, not only in the service, but through giving, we know that God has given us all that we have. All our finances and all that he's given us is from him. And one way to worship God is to give some of that money back. The offering money helps to go to our ministries, all the things that we do, and also even our mission trip that's going to come up soon as well, which you'll learn about in a few moments. So if you feel called to give, there's offering envelopes in front of you and in the resource center as well. And you can give online. For upcoming events, we have a prayer summit this Wednesday. Last week, Pastor Ray preached about a vision and mission of Willingham Church. We also got to see some amazing testimonies of people that have been touched through our ministries as well. And while all the ministry, the vision, and the ideas are very good and wonderful, but they only succeed if God is behind it. And in order for us to really follow God, we need to spend time praying. Not just the elders and the pastors, not just the people on stage, but every one of you is important as well. And so we want to encourage you all to come this Wednesday night at 7 o'clock to our church prayer summit. And to pray alongside of us for the, God's glory and his vision for Willingham Church. The cafeteria will also be open at 5 o'clock. I know sometimes after work or after school you get off and your mind is kind of focused on work or you're kind of burned out. But you guys can come early at 5 o'clock to the cafe, get some dinner, talk to some people, get some encouragement, pray for each other, share updates during the week, and just kind of get yourself in a prayer mode for the prayer summit as well. And afterwards, we'll have some snacks and refreshments too. And the last event to talk about is there's a Women's Awakened Retreat. We want you to save the date. It's on Saturday, April 20th. Tickets will go on sale on March 24th. And if you want any more information, you can go to the Resource Center for that too. I'm going to hand it off to Pastor Ruben. In a moment, we're going to watch a video kind of talking about our upcoming Brazil mission trip.
Hi, I'm Chantel. I'm Brendan. I'm Sam. And I'm Jerry, and we're missionaries in San Fernando, Brazil, and we're really looking forward to the team arriving in two weeks. Chantal and I are here in the Amazon for four months, serving as a media and follow-up team. Our job is to help with fundraising by documenting projects, traveling with medical teams, church construction, and interviewing pastors out in the river communities. I'm Sam. I am down here in Brazil for about three months, and I'm working with the children's ministry out here in the river communities. My role as a missionary here is I'm, I'm working on special projects and special projects would include recruitment of new missionaries, water filter program, fundraising for specific projects, and uh, hosting international teams. So that's a little bit of what I do here. We are excited to have our Willingham team come in the next couple of weeks. And we're going to a community called Arapiranga, which is about five hours from Santa Rain on the Top Hills River. And we're going to this community, which is a community of about 40 families, to help build a, a church building there. See you, See you soon. soon. There's a bee on my head. <laughs> help me, help me. <laughs> Great. Good morning, family. My name is Ruben, one of the pastors here in Willingdon Church. I uh, have the privilege to you to present the second mission trip in the year, and this time they are going to Brazil. There are any Brazilians here? Ah, yeah, good. They are going to work alongside with our missionaries, uh, Jerry, Chantal, Brandon, and Samantha, uh, working with the locals in the local villages in the Amazon River. They are going to participate in different minist ministries, uh, mainly construction, home visitation, uh, women ministry, kid ministry, uh, medical dental ministry. So it's, uh, it's going to be busy for them. So here we have uh, Amos, we have Toby, Ivan, Vincent, Cole, and Carl. Carl is the team leader of the team. They are leaving this coming Wednesday uh, in the morning. So I, will ask you, I ask you to stand up and uh, join me in prayer for them. Heavenly Father, we are here together to pray for the safety and protection of the team as they travel to and work in the Amazon with Jerry, Brendan, Chantal, and Samantha, our missionaries. We pray for the health and strength of each member of the mission team. Lord, we ask you to grant them stamina and vitality as they engage in physically demanding work and navigate potentially challenging conditions. We pray for unity. We pray for teamwork among the mission team members. We pray for cultural sensi sensitivity and un understanding as the, as the mission team interacts with the local community in the Amazon. We pray that the local communities in the Amazon, we have open hearts and minds to receive the mission team and receive the message of hope and salvation of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Heavenly Father, we pray for you, Lord, that through the power of the Holy Spirit, strengthens their faith and remind them of your presence in their life and the importance of their mission. Lord, we are very grateful for this opportunity to lift up the Brazil mission team in prayer and by committing their journey and work into your loving and capable hands. I pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. Um, the team, we have a kiosk outside. You can come and uh, ch chat with the team, get to know about the team, and find another ways to support the team. And I will ask you to keep standing because we are, uh, Pastor Jonathan is going to read the scriptures. Thank you. Good day. Today's scripture reading is Mark chapter 14, 1 through 11. It was now two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. 
And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him by stealth and kill him. For they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. And while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly. And she broke the flask and poured it over his head. There were some who said to themselves indignantly, why was the ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you. And whenever you want, you can do good for them. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. And truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he sought an opportunity to betray him. May God bless the reading of his word. You may all be seated. Great. Thank you, Jonathan. Good afternoon, church. It is good to be with you. We have the privilege of starting our Easter series today. My name is Brody, um, and I normally get to serve with the senior high students downstairs, but I am glad to be able to bring the word for us this morning. Our Easter series is called At Cross Purposes, When God's Plans Are Not Our, or Not Ours. This month, we're letting the Gospel of Mark guide our hearts as we prepare for Easter. When we're looking forward to an important moment, it's critical that we prepare ourselves well in advance. We don't want any surprises along the way to frustrate our plans. When I was in high school, I got to go on a mission trip, not to Brazil, but to Montreal, to partner with a few other churches and do street evangelism, among a number of other projects. My pastor prepared us well, but once we got there, we realized that the mission looked a lot different than what we had prepared for. And partway through the week, we chose not to engage in one of the activities. And our church was suddenly viewed as stubborn and resistant. So now we had to try to salvage the relationship that we were having with the other churches, let alone preach the gospel to the people of Montreal. Preparation for key events in our lives gives us the peace of mind that things are taken care of. And it speaks to a value that we place on the events or the people that those events impact. Sometimes we experience unexpected twists along the way and things don't go how we'd like. In today's passage, a woman prepared Jesus for the work he was about to accomplish on the cross. She didn't know the full extent that her act of worship was accomplishing, and the people around her certainly experienced an unexpected twist in their evening. But Jesus had much more in mind, and God's plans were not frustrated. Jesus knew that he was on the way to the cross, and this woman was preparing him to step into the work that his father had prepared for him. Today we will see two types of hearts on display. At the start and at the end of our passage, we see the heart that gives up Jesus for anything else. And in the middle with this woman, we see the heart that gives up anything else for Jesus. As we see these perspectives, our own hearts will be laid bare and we will be forced to answer this question. Is Jesus worth it? So let's get back into our passage, starting in verse one and two. It was now two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him by stealth and kill him. For they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. Mark's gospel is urgent. There are two days until Passover. We're running out of time. We're coming to the crescendo of Christ's purpose here on earth. After three years of preaching and working miracles and ministering, Jesus chose to spend his last week teaching in the temple. 
And the people around Jesus often misunderstood his purposes. One such group were the religious leaders. They wanted to preserve their religious laws and their traditions, which Jesus challenged. These leaders concluded they had to kill Jesus and they justified their murderous intentions by claiming that Jesus was a blasphemer. After all, only a few days earlier, they had seen Jesus receive worship from the crowds as he entered Jerusalem, something that was reserved for God alone. The hard hearts of the religious leaders chose to hate Jesus instead of let him enter in. Jerusalem itself would have been overcrowded since it was Passover. This was one of the key annual uh, celebrations of the Jews, still goes on today, as they remember how God led their ancestors out of slavery in Egypt into the promised land as free people. At that time, God sent his angel of death to kill the firstborn of any Egyptian household as the final plague of judgment against Pharaoh. If the angel came to a house with blood painted on the door frame, the angel would pass over the house and the family would be spared. Every year, the Jews killed a lamb and offered its blood as a remembrance commanded by God so they would never forget God's mighty display of salvation from Egypt. This is what the people were in Jerusalem to celebrate. The religious leaders had to plan carefully so their plans wouldn't be frustrated by the crowds, many of whom heard Jesus teaching in the temple all week long. Now it seems Jesus retired through the week to the home of some friends in the village of Bethany, about three kilometers from Jerusalem, which is less than a walk around Deer Lake. It's so close, I tried looking up a map, but the word Jerusalem covers where Bethany would be. It's right next door. Here we switch in our verse three from the malicious intent of the religious leaders to a much quieter and peaceful evening with Jesus having a dinner party at a friend's house. Verse three. And when he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly, and she broke the flask and poured it over his head. In John's gospel, John also records this account. He adds a few more details as well. There we learn that this woman was Mary, whose siblings were Martha and Lazarus. They shared a very close relationship with Jesus. Remember, Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. Some scholars believe that Simon could have been the father of this trio and that Jesus had healed him of his leprosy, his skin disease. Jesus had given this man healing and deliverance from his condition. At the table, Mary came and poured on Jesus an ointment of pure nard made from the flowers of the Himalaya mountains in India. Mark makes a point to call it very costly, a point that isn't lost on the dinner guests, but we'll get to that in just a moment. There was no hiding what Mary was doing. The entire room suddenly came alive with the scent of nard. The oil flowed down from Jesus' head and soaked the clothes that he was wrapped in, and the scent wafted across the table and filled the whole house. Mary gave what was likely a prized family possession. Nard was reserved for high ceremonies, including burials, which, again, we will get to in just a moment. There were other common oils that would have been used for anointing. This was unique, this was special. This was an all-in moment for Mary. She declared that Jesus was her great treasure. Jesus worth more to her than anything else. Mary reveals a heart that gives anything else for Jesus. To her, Jesus surpasses all else. Last week, uh, we saw a video from one of our life group leaders and she shared the story about a member of her group who walked with Jesus, believed in Jesus despite the threat of death in her home country. She said she would rather die with Jesus than live without him. That's this kind of heart. So we should consider our own lives. What have we given up for Jesus? What has lost its allure, its worth, 
compared to knowing Jesus. I don't want to gain the whole world and give up my soul. In Philippians 3, Paul wrote, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Think of what Mary had witnessed. Her brother Lazarus had been dead, buried for four days. She watched Jesus command him to rise back up to life, and he did. If Simon is Mary's father, she would have seen Jesus heal his leprosy and restore him to health and community. Mary had seen the goodness of God and recognized that she didn't have to cling to any earthly thing because Jesus is worth it all and more. You'd think that this would be a pleasant moment for this dinner party. What a beautiful thing Mary has done for Jesus. The whole dinner party gets to enjoy the sweet aroma and partake in the meal. But that's not what happened. Verse four. There were some who said to themselves indignantly, why was the ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they scolded her. I have here a picture of number one imperial majesty. It's a cologne. It's supposed to be up there. Um, but it was created by Christian Clive in 2005. It's a beautiful bottle. It's got diamonds all over it. Uh, its value is 2000, sorry, 205 thousand dollars for 500 milliliters. Two hundred five thousand dollars for half of this water bottle of cologne. Most expensive cologne ever created. There were only 10 bottles, so do the math, very expensive. And I managed to get my hands on some. Fifty dollars. Lunch with a friend. That's a day of work. A week, a month, a year. This is water. <laughs> I have to clarify every time because I haven't had my salary review yet. <laughs> so I would not afford number one Imperial Majesty. But Mary didn't have just a little vial like this. She had a whole flask and she broke it on Jesus and it's pure and it's expensive. And the people there, they said it's worth 300 denarii and that was a year's worth of wages for a common worker. Wasted. That's what they say. What did Mary's act of worship accomplish? She was giving a fragrant and a flagrant display of loyalty to Jesus. Dinner's on the table, conversation is lively, and Jesus is suddenly drenched in oil. And the smell of the ointment mingles with the dinner aromas, and now it's not just the food that's heated, tempers are flaring, and people are pointing and shouting and scolding Mary. What a chaotic scene has unfolded. And it's in the midst of this chaos, as he normally does, that Jesus chooses to speak. Verse six, but Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, and whenever you want, you can go you can do good for them, but you will not always have me. Jesus defends Mary's worship. He recognized the sacrifice that she made for him and what it meant for him as the week drew closer and closer to his death and his burial. When Jesus said, you will not always have me, he was alluding both to his death on the cross, but also to his eventual ascension back to heaven, where he would not walk the earth anymore until the day that he comes back. To this end, Jesus highlights the true work that Mary's worship accomplished. In verse eight, Jesus says, she has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. 
Whether she knew it or not, Mary prepared Jesus for the suffering he was about to endure. In a sense, Mary got to partner with Jesus to carry on his ministry. She joined him in the work of his death and burial by preparing him to endure and have his body laid to rest as he paid the death penalty for our sin. Throughout his ministry, and especially in these final days before the cross, God saw fit to give Jesus other people and angels to minister to him. God does so much more than we expect. He does so much more than we could possibly prepare for. As we worship and obey, we get to join in on the mission of Jesus. God does things beyond our ability, but works through our obedience to fulfill his plans. God brings us into the mission Jesus is on, and we get to participate when we see the worth of Jesus for who he truly is. He is the king, worthy of anointing. He is the Messiah, worthy of following. Jesus is the one true God, worthy of all our adoration and worship. In contrast to the dinner guests casting their curses on Mary and complaining about the apparent atrocity she committed, Jesus instead declares a blessing. He says in verse 9, Truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, What she has done will be told in memory of her. We see that fulfilled today. We see that fulfilled all the way up until today. Mary is remembered for her love of Jesus, a love that drove her to give away what was possibly one of her most prized possessions. She knew that the man who sat in front of her was worth far more than a jar of perfume. Have we tasted and seen that the Lord is good? Mary loved Jesus before knowing the work that he would accomplish on the cross. How much more reason for us to celebrate and praise God? How much more reason for us to confess that Jesus is our greatest reward, our prized possession, our treasure of infinite value? Jesus is worth it. And he invites us to use the things that he has given in this life to further the work that he is now accomplishing. Our hearts can be rewired to see money as a means of service, not as a master to serve. Money is a means of service, not a master to serve. Both Jesus and the apostles were supported by men and women opening their homes and financially supporting their mission. It becomes easier for us to give into the mission when we realize we aren't the source of our possessions, of our security in the first place. God has given each of us a measure of intellect, finance, gifting, talent, Last week, Pastor Ray shared Willingdon's vision as we seek to follow after Jesus. So if you've been given much, what is God calling you into? How is God calling you to participate? And if you have been given little, what is God calling you into? How is he calling you to participate? We can be used in minor and major ways. Nothing is inconsequential to Jesus. No act of service is too small or too big for God. The mission of God starts in small ways in our lives and in our homes and spills out into the city and across the world. Some of us are holding onto dreams and possessions that we need to give up for Jesus. He can rework our purpose so we discover our true value is in him. He redeems our work, our wants, our ways. His value and worth spill over onto us, anointing us as his brothers and sisters, covering us 
with his blood through his death on the cross so we can be born into a new and living hope by his resurrection, a hope that cannot be lost or stolen or destroyed. That's the reality of finding and knowing the worth of Jesus. To quote the late missionary Jim Elliott, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. But we don't always see it that way. A voice of doubt creeps up in our mind. Is Jesus everything he says he is? Amen. We find ourselves at cross purposes with others who don't put the same value in Jesus. Our loyalty to him is questioned, or at the very least, it makes us weird. Some say we're stuck in the dark ages, chasing the wind or just playing out of our minds. We see success and security and we want it. We might feel like we've wasted our lives on Jesus, especially when we can't see what his purposes are. And our passage takes a sinister twist. It was not just the religious leaders who had closed their stubborn hearts to Jesus. No, one of Jesus' very own who was at that dinner party had seen enough. Verse 10, then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray him. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he sought an opportunity to betray him. <clears throat> Judas missed the, worst, wor- missed the worth of Jesus. His heart and the heart of the religious leaders were hearts that give up Jesus for anything else. They give up Jesus for anything else. Matthew wrote in his gospel account that Judas agreed to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. You have Mary anointing Jesus with a flask of oil worth a year's wages. She couldn't get enough of Jesus. And you have Judas selling Jesus out for something like 250 bucks. He had seen enough of Jesus. We could say a lot about the amount that Judas received. The 30 pieces is an allusion to the prophet Zechariah in the Old Testament, which itself is an allusion back to the law of God when God sets this price as recompense if a slave was injured by someone else's bull. 30 pieces of silver given to the owner of the slave if the slave was injured. This was not a commentary on the value of a slave, but it showed the contempt of those who had no regard for Jesus. The religious leaders saw Jesus as the lowest of the low, a slave and servant worth practically nothing. Judas revealed that he was blind to the eternal value of Jesus, who is not a slave, but the king. And so we turn it back on ourselves. How do we miss the value of Jesus? In what ways do we trade Jesus for lesser things? When our plans are not God's plans, we sin by trusting ourselves to the things that pale in comparison to Jesus. We claim that whatever that thing is, it's better than him. When we sin, we declare that we want that thing more than Jesus. In our greed, we want money. In our lust, we want sensuality. In our gluttony, we want to be gorged. In our pride, we want to be praised. And we shove Jesus aside. The religious leaders in Judas, they saw the life of Jesus on display for three years of ministry. They heard his mission. They saw his miracles. They listened to his message. But they wanted a warrior king, someone that would deliver them from the powers that they saw as oppressing them, the political rulers of the day. What good was a humble servant Messiah like Jesus? And the great irony is that to some degree, 
Judas and the religious leaders, they were actually onto something. Jesus, king of the universe, he did become a servant. Philippians 2, Paul writes this, Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And Mark records the words of Jesus just a couple chapters before today's reading. Jesus said, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus came to be servant. He came in humility and gave up his life for the Marys and the Judases. Jesus saw Mary full of love and worship and knew her heart was still wicked and sinful. He knew she needed to be saved out of her sin and her evil ways. She needed to be brought back to the Father and Jesus called Mary to follow him. Jesus saw Judas, a wayward thief, and knew his heart was still wicked and sinful. He needed to be saved of his sin and his evil ways. He needed to be brought back to the Father and Jesus called Judas to follow him. Jesus sees each of us. He sees the you's and he sees the me's. And he knows our hearts are wicked and sinful. We need to be saved out of our sin and our evil ways. We need to be brought back to the Father. Jesus calls us to follow him. So the king became the servant and he gave his life as a ransom. How much value is in the life of an eternal king of the universe? We can't put a price on the one who put the stars in the sky, the earth in motion, breathed life into being itself. We can't ascribe enough worth to the Lord of glory who sits enthroned above all creation, commanding and sustaining according to his word and his will alone. We can't count up the cost of the life of the Son of God, perfect in all his ways. A ransom paid by Jesus is paid in full and then some. And now we can know the vast riches of God to receive the love and affection of our good Father. He did not spare his own son, and now he calls us into life, and life abundant through Jesus. What joy we have to know his worth and his wealth and the depth of his love. How can we keep from declaring his mercy and his grace to a world so desperately in need? We are no better, but we've met the one who is. We've met the one who is worth it all. Jesus gave his life for us that we would live through him. His death was the cost of our sin, a price we could not bear to pay. And this is important. An infinite cost for sin committed against an infinite God which demands infinite payment. The problem isn't the size of your sin. The problem is the size of the one that you've sinned against. We can't cover that cost. No matter how hard we try to live well or do the right things or strive for perfection, we can't do it. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, we have been saved. I am so glad that God's plans are not my own. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. His life in place of our own. His value bestowed 
on us. We are bought with a price according to the riches of his grace that we might walk in new life, keeping in step with the one who died and is alive forevermore. Jesus is so worth it. And so I can't think of a better way to celebrate the worth of Jesus than to declare together what he has accomplished on the cross by participating in communion this morning. Today's anointing took place, Mark says, two days before Passover. Communion, the Lord's Supper, happened at that Passover meal. Here is what Mark records. Just a couple of verses later, still in verse, chapter 14, verse 22. And as they were eating, he took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them. And Jesus said, take, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank of it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Jesus physically took our place and died, shedding his blood so that we wouldn't have to die for our sins, not only physically, but eternally. We get to live forever because he is alive forever and has defeated sin, has thrown death into the grave. Any who come to him, any who believe, receive life. When we give up everything else for Jesus, we receive more than we could possibly imagine. So if you're one of the communion servers this morning, if you're helping actually receive the trays to pass them out, please come to the front at this time. We'll be passing the trays through the rows and when you receive the bread, just wait until I come back up to the front so that we can all participate together and then we will do it again with the cup. Communion is for any who belong to and believe in Jesus. If today is your day, if today you want what Jesus offers, you can receive life in him. Ask God to forgive your sin. Confess your need for Jesus' salvation and declare him to be your Lord and Savior. Then you can participate in this celebration with us. There's nothing you have to do. God gives us the faith to believe. So believe today. Make it today. And don't leave here without telling someone that you chose to follow Jesus. As Jonathan mentioned, we have a welcome center, a prayer center, a resource center. Maybe you came with a friend. Maybe you're here on your own. You want to talk with me. I'll be down here afterwards. Would love to hear from you. We want to walk with you on your journey. But if today you are not at that point, then I'm still so glad that you're here. And I urge you, to face your heart's desperate need for Jesus. You can't make it on your own. Jesus offers himself without reservation so you can be healed and set free. But if you're not there, then as the trays come to you, just receive them and pass them by. There's no shame in that. Everyone in this room has passed the trays at one point. But we are glad that you are here to witness this moment with us. It's also our custom here at Willingdon that we take a moment of silence to reflect on our hearts before God. Is there praise to offer? Is there sin to confess? If you've sinned against a brother or a sister or, one, or they've sinned against you, you get to make it right today. You don't get to end today with something sitting over you or sitting over them. We get to forgive each other because Jesus has forgiven us of so much more. So let's pause and invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us now.
Father, we thank you that there is nothing that can separate us from the love that you have for us in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We praise you this day in your name. Amen. I invite our brother Tom to come up and pray the blessing over the cup. Or sorry, this is bread. Over the bread. Jesus是为我们打破你的宝血是为我们而流每当我们在你的饼杯面前我们都来静默的思想你谢谢你亲爱的主谢谢你你你帮助我们在这个饼杯在这个饼杯里面我们都知道你给了我们很大的生命谢谢你你为我们破碎谢谢你谢谢你我们这一群人是蒙了你何等大的恩典能够能够得到你这样的救恩能够白白的春意能够成为一群新造的人亲爱的主耶稣求你能够用你的圣灵来带领我们来光照我们看看我们里面还有还有什么不讨神喜悦的地方还有什么地方甚至于陷在最终我们不过是人有的时候也会软弱有的时候会跌倒甚至于有时会远离神有的时候会得罪神求你多来接近我们来赦免我们的罪洗净我们一切的不义亲爱的主耶稣基督求你能够用不变的爱来找回我们让我们能够来回到你这个家庭来回到你这个教会求让我们大家今天都带着一颗喜乐的心带着一颗感恩的心带着一颗感恩的心来领受你的饼杯来坦然无惧的来到你的面前来侍奉你来敬拜你来荣耀你谢谢主垂听我们的祷告祷告是奉靠我主基督耶稣宝贵的名求的
the body of Christ given for us. Let us remember and participate together. I'm going to ask Eddie to come up and pray the blessing over the cup. Amado Señor Jesús, estamos aquí hoy reunidos, Señor, para uh, recordar ese momento, Señor, donde tú te ofreciste como perfecto sacrificio, Señor, por nuestras transgresiones, por nuestras ofensas, Señor. Gracias, Señor, porque tú, siendo obediente, Señor, fuiste ese perfecto, ese perfecto cordero, Señor, para derramar tu sangre por nuestro pecado, Señor. Bendito Dios, en tu palabra dijiste también que tú no volverías a tomar el vino hasta que tu reino viniera aquí a, a, nuevamente, Señor. Y nosotros estamos esperando ese día ansioso, Señor, donde tú nuevamente vienes aquí a reinar, Señor, y traes tu reino a la tierra. En el nombre de tu Hijo Jesús. Amén. suffering blood and tears how can it be there's a God who weeps there's a God who bleeds oh praise the one who would reach for me hallelujah to the son of suffering and some imagine you are distant and removed but you chased us down in merciful pursuit to the sinner you are great and the broken you embraced and in the end the proof is in your wounds and in the end the proof is in your wounds blood and tears how can it be there's a god who there's a God who bleeds, oh praise the one who would reach for me, hallelujah to the son of suffering. God in heaven, your blood still speaking, your love still reaching, all praise, King Jesus, glory to God forever, your cross, my freedom, your stripes, my healing, all praise, King Jesus. Glory to God in heaven, your blood 
God's law says that life is in the blood. And Jesus says his blood was poured out for the forgiveness of many, for the salvation of many. And so we participate, we take this together and we remember. Amen. Father God, you are a just and holy God, far beyond our comprehension in perfection and in majesty and in grandeur and in grace. Father, because you are love, you looked on us in our death. You looked on us in our rebellion. You looked on us in our hatred of you. And you chose to extend your love to us. Father, you sent your son, Jesus Christ, that we could have eternal life. And on the cross, you paid Jesus for our sin by shedding your blood, giving up your body so that we could be covered so that we could be free, so that we could be born again. Jesus, you left the grave behind and you sent your spirit to dwell in us as your brothers and sisters, as children of the Father. And so I pray that as we go from this place, as we look forward and prepare for Easter, we would not lose your purposes but instead that we would be brought alongside what you are accomplishing. God, may we see mountains move. May we see dead people brought to life, not because of any power we have, but because of the power that you are in us. You have brought us to life. We praise you, Jesus. We pray this all in your most powerful name. Amen. Amen. We are going to continue to worship with one more song. I invite you to stand as we do that. And if you can pass your cups to the aisles, the servers will come by with buckets. But let us continue to worship. Let's sing your cross. Your cross, my freedom, your stripes, my healing, all praise, King Jesus. Glory to God in heaven, your blood still speaking, your love still reaching, all praise, King Jesus, glory to God forever, your cross, my freedom, your stripes, my healing, all praise. Glory to God in heaven, your blood still speaking, your love still reaching, all praise, King Jesus, glory to God forever. God who weeps, there's a God who bleeds. Oh, praise the one who would reach for me. Hallelujah to the Son of
the letter of Jude, the last verses. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Go in grace.